Welcome. Good to see you. Anybody make it to church today? I asked earlier. Anyone what? Make it to church. Yes. Great. So you probably heard the, the classical Christmas story today. Yes. So I'm doing something completely different. Because <laughs> it's Christmas Eve. Woo-hoo! We are excited to be here. Tom and Lisa Mann, if you don't know us, uh, with uh, Calvary Baptist Church, Heavy Deep in Real Ministries. We are on our normal or Sunday, but it turns out it's Christmas Eve. And no one else was doing anything tonight here, because sometimes on holidays, we don't get to come. So we're very excited to be here tonight on our regular fourth Sunday. Woo! It's awesome. So we're going to do this like we always do. We're going to open in prayer and then get right into what we're going to talk about. So join me. Father, thanks for these incredible women. Lord, thanks for this ministry that Lisa and I are blessed to come do. Uh, Lord, I would just ask you, search their hearts tonight for whatever their needs are. Um, Sometimes holidays are not the greatest for everybody. So we just ask, Lord, that uh, for those who are celebrating and feel joy, outstanding. Lord, for those who are a little down, uh, just search their hearts and be with them and give them the encouragement of whatever it is that they need. Maybe your words through my mouth tonight as we talk about Jesus, which is the reason for the season. Praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. So when when you when you hear about like the Christmas story, you, you talk about the baby Jesus being born and that the purpose of this was sin came through the world through Adam through a man and sin had to be defeated by a man and so God begot his only begotten son and brought him here to die for the sins of the world he paid a price we couldn't pay. You, you know that you know the drill, right? And it's kind of theology and and doctrine. Well, that's not very relational. I was thinking about this this morning, that we say that Christianity is about relationship. It's not religion. So I want to kind of separate tonight the difference between like doctrine, which is like the Godhead three in one, one in nature, three in person, subservient in duties. I learned that from my theology professor. He'd be so proud. Um, But that's not relational in any way. And what I love about Jesus and I love about this time of year, it's not my favorite time of year, by the way, but I, I, I like this part. The Word became flesh. The Word became flesh. And it's important to me as someone who has had suffering in life, because who wants to pray to a God and be with a God that doesn't understand them? If you look at the history of religion, it's a lot of appeasing God, isn't it? You got to appease the gods of the Greeks and the Romans, and you, if you don't do right, they punish you, and all you know all this mythology that you read about. But our God is the only one that came to dwell with us, to experience what we experienced, so that in this relationship we have, He knows us, He knows what we've been through. And I landed on the uh, um, Hebrews, a verse in Hebrews that really strikes me. I'm going to read a couple of different translations. This is the English Standard Version. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. I think it's Hebrews 4.15. In the Aramaic, now Aramaic is the language Jesus spoke. It was like the colloquial Hebrew. He says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so the word that they use for sympathy here is obviously sympathio, which is Greek, compassion, feels. And I would tell you that, I don't know if it's you guys or or me, but for me, the biggest thing that I want is to be known. I, I think that in our human relationships, the thing we want is to be known. We want someone to understand us. We want someone to feel what we feel. We want that kind of level of not sympathy, not compassion, but empathy. We want someone to know us. And when we're joyful, we like to share that. When we're hurting, we like to share that. We want someone to understand and know that. And what Hebrews tells us is Jesus knows us because he came in the flesh. Now, certainly there is the doctrine part of this, where that he was born, he, he did all the, his ministry, he spread the good news, and the good news is you're not able to die for your own sins and pay the price, so he is going to fulfill the requirements of the law, which is a blood sacrifice for the sins of the world. He dies, he's buried, he's resurrected, and he ascends. Good news! For those who believe, you have eternal life with Jesus, right? Even John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whomever shall believe him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life, right? And so that's great stuff. 
But when I look at Jesus, I want the relationship part. I mean, the doctrine part, the dogma part, it's easy to understand. Um, and and you, can, you can recite that. As a matter of fact, a lot of atheists can recite the dogma. But where they miss, uh, there's a great line that says, a lot of people miss by 18 inches. That's the distance between your head and your heart. I know a lot of people, even in the faith, that have a lot of head knowledge. They just they know this stuff. They know this stuff better than I do. But they don't have any heart knowledge because they don't understand the relational part of Jesus. They don't understand that Jesus came in the flesh to experience what we experience. And what is this world like? The world's pain. The world's trauma. This is a fallen world. There's a lot of hardship here. And when you read Jesus' story, what I like about it is when I pray and I talk to Jesus, I know completely he knows what I'm going through. Could you imagine praying to a God that didn't? Was, was, was not in a relationship with you? Expected worship? But that, that there was nothing back? There's no relationship? You ever been in a relationship where you're doing all the work and the other guy isn't? Yeah. Yeah, it's one hand clapping, isn't it? You hear that noise? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> so I wanted to go through a little bit about what Jesus faced, his difficulties he's faced. And maybe some of these will resonate with you that you do have someone to talk with divinely who has the same experiences you have. Ever been laughed at? You're not the worst. Are you laughing at me or laughing at Okay. Uh, I think one of the things with me that was about hardest is humiliation. When I was a kid, I got humiliated a lot. It made me very angry. Um, to this day, if I see someone being humiliated, I get, I get, I get very bowed about it especially a kid. Um, well, Jesus, they laughed at him. There's, there's a scene in Matthew, Matthew 9, where he's going to a, a house where a girl has died. And the crowd's there. Now, in, now you understand in, in Jewish culture, uh, death crowds kind of go there. They actually pay people to wail. And all these people are there wailing and things. And he says, no, no, she's just asleep. And they laugh at him like he's an idiot. Then he goes up and revives her, right? And she, she comes back from the dead. It's the first time someone's actually raised from the dead. But he's, he's, uh, he's the son of God, and they just laughed at him. I think there's, there's nothing more difficult than that. And it can happen in relationships. It can happen where you're not taken seriously. It can happen when, um, uh, you know, you're, you're being bullied. Anybody been bullied? Yeah. Jesus was kind of bullied. And imagine this big crowd of people just... Believe me, you're stupid. Some of us have been through that. I, I know I have. And so when I'm having those moments where I'm seeing something that I don't like and I'm getting kind of bowed up about it, I can pray to Jesus and he can respond to me because he had the same thing happen. And we have connection. We have relationship. He goes, oh, Tom, I've been there, done that, relax. Right? Now, this one's an interesting one. Scripture says he has no place to lay his head. No place, he's homeless. If you watch his guys, what do they do? They just travel around. <laughs> They're not like going home. Maybe they hang, hung out at Peter's place a little bit. His wife kicked him out. Um, he didn't have a home. He was transient. He knows your plight. He knows what it's like. I've been homeless. He knows what it's like, the insecurity, the the. the feeling of inadequacy, of not being able to take care of yourself, the feeling of nobody's there to help me. Everyone's kind of against me. He, he, go, he knows that. So when you go to prayer and you say, man, I, my circumstances right now just really stink. He goes, yeah, I know. <laughs> but, I, but I'm here. I get it. And I love that about Jesus because we don't have a God that we just worship and are supposed to love and get nothing back from. Matter of fact, it says in Scripture that He loved us before we loved Him. While we were still sinners, He died for us. And, and, and His love for us was so great, even before we could even love, because we can't love without Him. He loved us and said, no, I'm, I'm going to experience what you experience so that we can have relationship. Where they were saying, He's out of His mind. <laughs> now, think about this. This is Mary... And, and, and the brothers. Mary, who had visited by the angel Gabriel to tell her that she was going to have this baby, Emmanuel, 
at, at right Mary's song, the whole Christmas story. And she's like, we got to go get that guy. He's nuts. He is back crap crazy. We got we to gotta get him in the house, right? But it gets worse. When he goes to his hometown, he gets rejected. Now, it's not like my hometown, Chicago, I go home and Chicago rejects me. It's, this is all relative. In, in tribal Israel at this time, that whole community was his family. And he went there and he says he couldn't do many miracles because the, there was no faith. And that he says even a prophet's rejected in his hometown. You ever had family just disown you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting in, my, in the ministry, at least, and I do, especially some of the stuff I do in my men's ministry, I, I say there are no throwaway people in God's economy. People aren't throwaway people. But it's funny how fam family, and this is why when Jesus is sitting there with the disciples, they say, your mother and brothers are here. He goes, who's my mother? Who's my brother? Only those who do the will of God. And he was saying, you know, I, I'm not going to fall into this tribalism. I, I, I'm going to be around my family who believe in doing the will of God. And, and in, in first century, that's just unheard of to say something like that. It was just so radical. But his family rejected him. And at the end, he reconciles it. Then he's on the cross and he tells John, this is your mother. Take care of her, right? So he at least takes care of his mother. And I always find it funny that you read the Bible and you're reading the, you're reading the epistles by John or by Paul, the letters, and you all of a sudden you come to James. And you go, James? Isn't that the brother of Jesus? Isn't that the one who thought he was crazy? Wasn't that the one? You know, could you imagine being Jesus and then showing up at home after the resurrection going, told you. <laughs> you know, poke him in the eye. Ah! You know, because James and Jude are right here in Scripture. And those are the two brothers, two of the brothers, stepbrothers of Jesus. And, uh, um, I would have loved to have seen that after they just rejected him and rejected him and rejected him because it was more than once. And then he just comes back and says, no, I, I am who I say I am. Um, I love that. Ever been abandoned? Have friends just drop you? Um, yeah. yeah, that sucks. You know, you, you think you have a friendship. You think you have a relationship. And they ghost you. Right? Or they don't forgive you or they don't show grace. They don't show any mercy. And that happened to Jesus. Jesus is sitting there with the 70 disciples, plus the 12. And he's teaching about communion. He's teaching about, this is my flesh. This, you have to eat it. It's real food. This is my blood. You have to drink it. It's real drink. And what he's, what he's doing the imagery of, and it's, it's an allegory of this, this concept we call communion. Well, they were taking it literally, that you eat his flesh and drink his blood. And they're like, ooh. And not only ooh, but that, that's against the law, against the laws of Moses. You can't do that, cannibal. And uh, um, they said, this teaching's too hard, and they left him. They abandoned him. And he's left with the 12. And he says, you guys want to leave too? Have I offended you? And they said, where else are we to go? You have the keys to eternal life, and the 12 stay. Um, but imagine for... This period of time he's out there preaching, and everyone's following him. He's got all these people, oh, oh, we're with you, Jesus, we're with you, we're with you, until you say something we don't like, and then we're not with you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Isn't that how life is? But one of my favorite sayings is, you're only valuable when you're valuable. <laughs> people, when you stop being valuable to somebody, isn't it amazing how your phone stops ringing? Except Jill's. Her phone rings all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so... Jesus understands if you're in a situation right now where you're feeling abandoned, where you're feeling no one's there for you, no one loves you, no one's no one is going to stand by you. Jesus has been there. And what, he, what does he say? No one can take you from his hand. He'll never abandon you. Ever. And that's comforting to me because I've been abandoned a lot in my life. And uh, um, when I learned that Jesus... Is that Jesus again? Today is your birthday. No, just uh, when I learned that Jesus would never abandon me, and there was this thing called loyalty. Loyalty matters to me a lot because of things happened to me as a kid. Um, and Jesus is completely loyal. I never have to worry about I'm going to pray, and Jesus says, <laughs> "No hablo inglés." <laughs> He's always going to be there for me. He's always going to connect. He's never going to put me on hold. And that's a good feeling because this world, people will drop you as soon as you're not valuable to them. 
this one I love. <laughs> it's a little, there's a little line in scripture where the, he's arguing with the Pharisees and he's telling them that about Abraham and how Abraham was glad of the day that he saw Jesus. And he's like, how can you be glad of Abraham? You're not even 50 years old yet. You, you couldn't know Abraham. And he's saying, you are not Abraham's children. And then they turn around and they basically say, uh, you're illegitimate. Because the story of Jesus was well known. Mary was pregnant before marriage and, ooh, and you know all these rumors and stuff. And they call him illegitimate right there in scripture. And he retorts back, you know, I, I know who my father is, and your father is Satan, is what he's saying. I mean, it was just, it was, a, it was a big battle, big, big argument. And I know folks who have been born out of wedlock and those type of things, and, and there's a stigma to it. There's a stigma to, to that kind of uh, beginning in your life. But Jesus knows. So if you're in that situation where, let's say you had that or you weren't wanted, I've, I've in some of the counseling that Lisa and I do, we find people that uh, find out that their parents didn't want them. They're an accident. And um, they, they went through and had the child, obviously. And I have to explain to them, this was planned from the beginning of time. You're no accident. This was, God knew. It's not like you showed up and went, wow, I didn't expect that one. Um, he knew. <laughs> but even Jesus understands what it's like to be called illegitimate and be made fun of that way. Man, I mean, do you even at Christmas? He's been hungry, been thirsty, right? He's been irritated. I know none of you here get that way. I do. Um, I love this scene. It was my favorite scene. Um, I like all these Bible things are all my favorite scene. He's sitting there, and the Jews again want a sign from him. And he says, how much longer do I have to put up with you people? I love it because he's like, ah, you're driving me crazy. You are driving me crazy, right? Um, and then the Pharisees, we need a sign. The only sign you'll get is the sign of Jonah, and the, which confuses them, but it's three days in the belly of the beast, right? Three days in the, in the tomb, uh, and he rises. He's, he just gets so frustrated by the lack of faith, by their challenging him. Everywhere he went, he was challenged. You ever see that in your life? Everywhere you go, someone's challenging you. Doesn't that just tick you off? Gosh, I hate that. You know, just challenge you, challenge, challenge. And it seems like, you know, it's, it's almost like the red light you hit when you're driving. <laughs> you know, everyone's time to hit red. <clears throat> you're just like, what is with these people? Uh, I like to say it's too peopley out there today. I can't go out. Um, too peopley. Too peopley. And so Jesus got irritated and he needed to spend time alone with the father to kind of get away from everybody for, for a while because it's like, I need to decompress. Ever been in a situation where you need to decompress and you need to cool down? Jesus did that. How, how did he do it? He did it through prayer. He got with the father and said, oh, Lord, the sheep stink. And uh, <laughs> I don't think he said that, but maybe he did. Yeah. That's in Tom Malonians 5.7. Yeah, the Aramaic, I actually have an Aramaic New Testament that's really good. Um, yeah, it's, it gives it a different flavor. <laughs> oh. I love it. I love it. The Aramaic is important because, for example, in Aramaic, we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and lead us not into it says, temptation. But that's not the Aramaic. The Aramaic says, Lead us not into testing, but deliver us from the evil one. And I like the Aramaic better because God doesn't tempt you. We're tempted by our own desires, but we are tested. Right? And so it's really good stuff. Ever been set up? No. Do you think Jesus was set up? How many times did they do something where they just watched? You know, the one time he was in the synagogue on a Sabbath and they got the guy with the bad hand. And Jesus asked them, Is it better to do good or evil? On a Sabbath. 
and they didn't answer. Like, we dare you. We dare you to heal him right now. You ever notice the Pharisees never argued that he, about the healings? They, they never said he didn't do it. Of course he did it. They were just mad when he did it. And then he just shook his head because he was so mad at him. He says, stretch out your hand. And the guy's healed. And then they plotted to kill him, it says, right after he did that. Nice religious group of people. <laughs> but he got set up. It's so yeah, so religious. Every time he went out, they tried to set him up. Until one point where he was, when they, they asked him a couple things. They asked him, um, the, 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 is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? And he, he says, let me see the coin. He sees Caesar's face on it. He says, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. And then it says, the scribes stopped arguing with him at that point, the lawyers, because they could not beat him in an argument. But through his entire ministry, all they did was argue with him and try to catch him, whether it's the adulterous woman, setting him up with, with trying to get him to violate the laws of Moses, or healing on a Sabbath, or eating the grain that he wasn't supposed to eat because it was a Sabbath. They were doing work and picking heads of grain and eating them. And he, he beats them up with the David line. I mean, over and over again, he's just having to defend, defend, defend. And how does he defend? He just defends by scripture. And, and he, but he's set up everywhere he goes. No matter what town he went into, he's pretty much set up. Um, Didn't they leave him alone after um, the Pharisees were, called him to come heal his son? Well, yeah, the child. yeah, the child. Yeah, it, it got to the point where they just realized they weren't going to catch him that way. And you, you, even the night of his arrest, you'll hear them talk about, you know, are you the son of God? And he says, you've said it. And they say, oh, blasphemy, we got him. <laughs> and uh, because he kept on using the I am statements. Right? Uh, do you remember ever being, you know, full of grief over something? Jesus has a couple of times when he, we see that in Scripture. He uh, grieves over Jerusalem. He, he's, he says, how I wish I could bring you under my wings, and, but they're just rejecting him, and it's breaking his heart. But he also grieved over his buddy Lazarus, who, who died. He says when he heard Lazarus died, he wept. Shortest verse in Scripture. Got a funny story about that. So when I was first back in church, I've been out of 25 years, and we go to this Lisa's best friend's little, little house, and we're just meeting her, and she's very nice. And they're playing games. I hate games. Absolutely. You and me hate games. And they got this game where you pop a balloon and there's a, a, a verse or something in there. And they give you a clue and you're supposed to be able to pieces of scripture. And you got to put the scripture together. Well, Lisa gets two pieces of paper in her balloon. He wept. I'm like, oh, how hard can this be? I pop my balloon. There's like 50 pieces of, I'm like, what the? <laughs> I couldn't figure out. What's that? They set me up, yeah, just to make fun of me. And uh, I've never forgotten it. So, Beth, if you're watching, ever been lied about? Oh, ho, 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 ho. Yeah, that's, that's a horrible feeling. And then how do you defend yourself against that, right? Because there's an old, old saying, so a lie told enough times is, turns into the truth. And... What's fascinating about Jesus is how he handled it. He got lied about all the time. He never defended himself. Even when they were, were, were bringing him through the trials, he didn't open his mouth. <coughs> but we have all these experiences in life that are negative. I mean, everyone in here said, oh, yeah, I've had all these experiences. Well, Jesus did too. He's just like us. He has suffered at the hands of men. He has suffered the, the trials of, of life. He's suffered um, with family he suffered with opposition. He suffered with grief. He's been blamed. He was arrested. I won't ask you if you've been arrested here because I don't want Lisa to raise her hand. Um, <laughs> no, you know it. That's, the, that's how I found her in the county clink. <laughs> oh, it wasn't you. <laughs> but it was, though. It was, though. <laughs> Next time you call me, I'll get you bailed out. <laughs> Right on. <laughs> so we look at the emotions of Jesus. He was angry. Ever been angry? Yeah. Now, the difference between, no, I know you, Lisa. You're, just not, you're fine. Never. The thing about Jesus' anger is righteous anger versus ours, which is like emotional anger. He was fearful. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he was, you know, his soul was so crushed. He's, he's sweating blood. Father, if it's, 
capable, take this cup from me, but not my will, but thine be done, right? He was disappointed a lot. People disappointed. I had a phrase when I was a kid, I still kind of use it, is, is expectation leads to disappointment. The higher your expectation, the more disappointed you cannot possibly be because you have an high expectation of somebody and they don't meet it, and they usually meet it down here, and uh, you get disappointed. And so sometimes we uh, have to work on our level of expectation. Well, imagine the Son of God coming for his people. He is the, he is the Messiah. He is the prophesied one. He has met all the conditions of the prophecies, and they reject him. Now, obviously, he knows this is going to happen. He knows he's going to the cross. He knows he's dying for the sins of the world. But it's still going to be extremely disappointing to have an expectation that your people would embrace you because you've proved it. Even John the Baptist at one point, he's in jail, says, you know, sends a disciple and says, are you the one? It's like, John the Baptist, really? You're his cousin. You, you make paths, make way of the straight, the, the, the paths for Jesus, right? He, are you the one? And, and Jesus says, well, John, tell John, if you don't believe anything else, believe the miracles. I'm, I'm doing all the things that scripture says I will do. So even John had disbelief. Even the expectation that John would stick by him didn't, didn't work. There's discouragement. He was discouraged. Um, could you imagine being around 12 people for three years and having them not get it? Well, part of it was there was there was sin going on in the temple. And that's just not okay. Yeah. So you get discouraged. You get discouraged when things are just plain to see. I mean, how much plainer can it be? And he's discouraged because people, even even the disciples, when when Jesus is is crucified before his resurrection, before he appears to them, they still don't understand. And even Jesus says, you won't really understand any of this until the, the counselor comes, until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then they go, oh, yeah, we kind of get it. It's like three years? You, that, that, that's discouraging. Scripture says he was a man of sorrows. A man of sorrows. And this is why I think it's so important. You hear me come here a lot of times and say, go wrestle with God. Go tell me how you feel. Yell at him, scream at him, cry, whatever you got to do. Because he gets it. He, he knows you. He's been you. He's experienced everything you've experienced. That's what scripture says in the Hebrews line. He's gone through everything you're going through. And when nobody else will believe you, when no one else will talk to you, when no one else is going to take your side, he's always there. He's always your biggest cheerleader. He's always going to be the one that stands up for you. And so this Christmas, I want you to think a little bit, you know, the, the Christmas story is great. Baby in the manger, happy, happy. Everyone's saying, but there's more to it than that. Jesus was born to die. He, he was born to die for the sins of the world. And he, he said, no one takes my life from me. I give it freely. No greater love hath man than to give his life for his friends, he says. But there's more to it than that. There's this idea that this, this, this religion, this Christianity, isn't dogma. It's not doctrine. It's not theology. It, it's not that stuff. It's relationship. With somebody who lived on this earth, experienced horrible things. All the things we experience, plus torture and murder. And he's your best friend. He wants to be in your life. He wants you to talk to him. He wants you to walk with him. He wants you to, to come to him. And it doesn't matter where you are in your faith. Whether you're like, I don't believe any of this, but I'm going to pray to you anyway. Or, you know, you're sold out. Think of the disciples when he called them. They weren't in the faith necessarily. They were just fishermen doing fishermen things. <laughs> there was no requirement to be something before you came to Jesus. Just come. And that's why he lived on this earth. The Word became flesh so that... Today, 2,023 years later, we can pray to him knowing fully that everything I tell him, whether I'm upset, angry, um, sad, happy, whatever it is, Jesus goes, I know. I went through that too. And I know that I am fully known by him. 
and that gives me a set of a sense of comfort that nothing in this world can give me. No person, no materialism, no money, nothing. Nothing gives me that sense of I'm okay than knowing that Jesus knows me fully and I can take a deep breath because I'm okay. So this Christmas, think of that baby Jesus, but think about how that baby Jesus knows you, has been there, done that, got the t-shirt, and there's nothing you're going to experience that he hasn't, and how you can have this relationship instead of a religion. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas.